Hello and welcome to another episode of Earth Your While. I'm Jack. And I'm Ellie. This is the podcast where we chat to industry experts and sustainable business leaders as we try to uncover the easiest and most effective ways to make your business better for the planet. Today we're here with Marcus Hemsley. Hi Marcus. Hello, happy to be here guys. <laughs> uh, for those of you that don't know, Marcus is the founder at the agency Fountain Partnership and he's also the founder of the Million Tree Pledge, which is a, a collective of businesses and individuals who have so far pledged to plant, is it 41 million trees? Is that right? Uh, it's 45 now, so it's wow. going up wow. by the day. <laughs> So yeah, and we've got 8 million in the ground so far as well. So that's really important. Amazing. So yeah, Marcus is saving the world slowly. <laughs> One um, so we're really excited to speak to you today, Marcus. Um, I guess the first thing, I don't know if you wanted to start by just sort of recapping like who you are and your background and how you guys came to be. Um, yeah, of course. So it's funny, the environmental side of the marketing kind of go hand in hand in a way. So I... I study philosophy at the University of East Anglia up here in, in Norwich and across the from the philosophy school across the way, there was the, you know, the ecology center, there were climate scientists. And I remember chatting to a friend of mine who was studying environmental sciences and she said, I'm not gonna have children. I just, I'm just too scared. And that really hit me. And uh, so speaking to those people that were scared about the future, and this is back in 2005, you know, the, the people on the front line scientists saying, look, it's not looking good really started to sort of make me think. And interestingly enough, my lecturer at the time, a guy called Dr. Rupert Reed, who was running to be MEP for the East of England for the Green Party. And I said, well, Rupert, I'd, I'd love to help you out, you know, with your campaigning. You know, what can I do? He said, what are your skill sets? And strangely enough, I'd, I'd come across uh, digital marketing. I always wanted to set up my own business and I've been going to all these personal development seminars. And I went to one called the World Internet Summit, and I'd learned all about you know, Google AdWords and I was doing keyword research and stuff, which probably sounds quite boring for a lot of your listeners. And it was boring for lots of my housemates as well at uni, but I found it interesting. And I said, look, I can run Google ads and Facebook ads for the Green Party. And he goes, brilliant. And he came back the next week and said, the East of England Green Party has got £40,000 for you to spend. And I was like, bloody hell. You know, I was a student who was earning £6 an hour working in a bar. So I, there I, I started cutting my teeth running Google ads and Facebook ads for the Green Party. And that was quite interesting. You know, back then, uh, you could bid on any word on Google, right? So I was thinking, okay, I want centre-left voters, you know, on Google, what are they typing in? And I, I thought, well, hold on a second, they read The Guardian and The Independent. So I'd run Google ads for the word Guardian, saying Labour voter, question mark, you know, here's why you should never vote um, Labour again. And they'd click to it and there'd be a video of the comedian Mark Thomas, who was quite popular at the time with Rupert saying, here's why you should vote green. So right at the very beginning, I was getting involved with uh, yeah, green politics um, and, and digital marketing. In 2009, when I graduated, well, graduated 2008, I started founding in 2009. Obviously, you know, I was just picking up work from various types of companies, but I always tried to move towards renewable energy. So working with uh, solar panel installers, heat pump installers, et cetera. And, you know, that, that, that was going really well. Um, it was quite funny at the time I had a bit of imposter syndrome. You know, I was like, who's going to, you know, like, listen to me. I'm just a graduate who's been playing around with this these ad words and stuff politically. So I offered a service whereby um, I just said, don't pay me unless I can get you a return on investment. So it was very much a sort of like, you know, performance-based approach. And that's uh, a large part of what Fountain does today. Um, but it's not all plain sailing, if I'm being really honest. I actually lost my way a bit. I got really into growing the business and we took on corporate clients. And I kind of forgot a bit about, you know, you know doing stuff for climate in, in a funny way. I was a, a Green Party councillor for four years, but around sort of 2015, 16, I was so focused on the business. I kind of lost my ethics a little bit, if I'm being honest. And we took on a, a sports car company. I won't say who it is, but there's this, you know, a car company that sells sports cars. And... I remember that we were we were running a campaign for them and it wasn't going perfectly. So they called me in to help with a strategy. And I, there's an expression in America where they say, like, you know, I left it 
all out on the field. But what I did is I, I turned up, I did a really, I put all my energy into really helping them sell more sports cars. And I was exhausted. And I remember walking out on my lunch break and I walked through the city centre and there were some children striking for the climate. And I just burst into tears because I realised, like, what am I doing? I'm using my energy to do something that's, you know, at that point, it was like a second awakening for me. I was like, no, this is it. Like, we're not, we're getting rid of that client and we're only going to focus on, you know, digital for good, ideally. And that that sort of spurred off my my journey. And then obviously a few years ago, set up the Million Tree Pledge. So that's a whistle-stop tour of me. Hopefully that's... <laughs> Actually, obviously, we've spoken on a few occasions, which has been nice. So I've got to know you a tiny bit. And I always notice you seem really, really wise and composed. What's that about? And how do I how do I get like that? Because that's how I would like to be. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that should be easy. And then every day is just like super intense, blah, 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 blah. And I speak to someone like you and I'm like, how does he do that? <laughs> what's What's the secret? Okay, so it, you catch me at my best moments, maybe. But no, if I'm, I'm being honest, so my mum was a C, or is a CBT therapist. She's retired now. So from the age of fifteen, I have been reading books on psychology and personal development and stuff, and that that has been a staple for helping me out a lot and uh, you know remaining balanced. Um, why is it's very kind of you to say? It's probably not my own wisdom. It's probably because I'm always reading and always learning, and I think you know. Like when you hang around with lots of people who are founders who are in business, they're always doing that. They're always on a podcast, they're always talking about ideas. You know, I can't remember which philosopher said it, but they said, oh, simple people, simple minds talk about um, other people, like okay minds talk about events and great minds talk about ideas. Now, I, I gossip as well, so I have a simple mind at times and talk about <laughs> other people, but I try and remember that, that actually, you know, like it's better to talk about ideas that are impacting the world rather than spend your time gossiping or talking about. I think it's interesting you said about like psychology, because I think really that's a secret, isn't it? I think any any uh, business or organisation that becomes successful or really successful, which is obviously, I mean, so, someone like me or someone like you, that's kind of how we think. I think at the end of the day, they just they just become really good at communicating, really mm. good communicators. Um, so yeah, and I suppose that's more important for you because you're in that space of marketing and you know building brands scaling absolutely everything's communication right it doesn't really matter what i what i think and say it's how you hear it you know and every message you put out is about how the person receives it and it's difficult because when you hear what i'm saying you know it's being cut with your mood your psych you know your, your history your psychology everything so you have to try and work out you know, what's the highest probability of communicating in a way that connects with people. But I think really it's quite simple. It's just being human. I think a lot of people with marketing and comms, they try and they overthink it and complicate it and they try and, you know, communicate in ways that just don't connect with people. I think the big mistake people make on the internet is they assume that people will take the time to really read something that's quite technical and quite dry and actually, there's a guy called Jakob Nilsson, who's a usability expert, and he says that when you're on online, you're sort of leaning forward when you read, and you're being very speedy and interactive, like different parts of your brain are lighting up. So there's there's an impatience there. When you're reading a book, you're leaning back, and you're more likely to to take in the words. But people don't think about that. Um, they 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 look at it as if like, oh, you know, everyone's going to take my time to read it. There's a a brilliant quote from a marketing book called Bored to Brave, which says that. Most marketeers think they sound like Han Solo, but actually they sound like C-3PO. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> yeah. I did, um, I listened to a, a TED talk um, and there's a guy talking, he was talking about, <clears throat> imagine if you were like in a, in a, it's obviously a marketer, imagine if you were in a party uh, in a room full of people and you just like stood up, stood up on a table and you just said, you know, you should, you should talk to me because I'm amazing and I'm really funny and I can do, and he said, imagine if that's what you did at a party, it wouldn't work. And he said, if you're a brand, imagine how you would communicate with people at a party if you were having fun, if you were trying to make a connection. And that's that's the secret to, or to content really, to how to communicate. Um, so. 100%. The, the mantra I have with, with, with content is, uh, is, is, is serve, don't sell. Yeah. yeah. Serving people and really helping them. Some of the best content I think we all consume, like is 
you want to solve problems publicly. You're saying, yeah. here's a problem that a lot of people find really difficult. It's quite painful. And here's some solutions that have worked for others. And hopefully it might work for you. And it's kind and it's helpful. And it's like you say, it's how I would be in person in one to one. Yeah. I did actually uh, stalk some of your content earlier. So <laughs> on LinkedIn. So you've probably seen, you've probably got a notification. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I think your content's really cool. I saw a thing about like burnout that you posted and I was I was kind of interested in that because I think that's something that I'm kind of struggling with. I don't know, I feel like maybe I'm like a bit earlier on in the journey than you are, are or have been. You know what I mean? But I don't know if you could explain. Yeah, it's such a common thing with founders. I think it really is, and I think um, the problem is is that we we've got this hyper stimulated world where we can always do more, right? you know like 100 years ago or so like you ran a business but you could clock off at a certain time you could go home and not be you know, you'd think about work but you wouldn't have to actually do it whereas now we can go online and do it all the time and the the observation i've had is that like people say oh, we need to slow down but we also that's not physically just physically it's mentally as well we have an inner speed mm -hmm. and we can really sort of rev up our thoughts and i don't know like we have know about you guys, if you've been like you know, on, on a holiday or on a beach or walking or whatever, like the speed of your thoughts is just slower. There's yeah. more of a content. And I think there's there's a natural speed to us. And, I, and the problem is we're always in fight or flight when we're working a lot. And there's a book I read years ago called Why, Why Zebras Don't Get Stress Ulcers. And it basically talks about all the other animals, right? And you think about it, if you look at like... Um, a wildlife program where there's a gazelle getting chased by a lion and the gazelle escapes and then 10 minutes later the gazelle's like grazing it's just relaxed and it's chilled it's out of fight or flight and it doesn't hasn't got ptsd it doesn't need to see a therapist like what's going on mm -hmm. and the difference is we've got a prefrontal cortex that can reimagine being chased by the lion and we yeah. can reimagine it for days and weeks and years and we can keep redoing that and revving it up and putting us in fight or flight and the the, the, the scientist that wrote it, this evolutionary psychologist, said that humans have only really evolved, like our cousins, the apes, etc., to be in fight or flight once every 72 hours. So if that's a healthy way to be. I'm in fight or flight. Like I was in fight or flight this morning when someone cut me up in traffic. I was driving in. And I was like, <laughs> you know, uh, I wasn't so stable and wise in that moment. So I was, I was and then I was late for a, a meeting. So I was rushing. So fight or flight again. And then something else happened that I didn't want this morning. I was in fight or flight again. And then someone said something, you know, they're going to change some copy on our website. I didn't agree with that. So four or five times. And then, but if I go home this evening and I'm replaying that in my mind, I'm getting all of that. So the body's getting full of cortisol, adrenaline, neuroadrenaline. And that's, that's okay for a little while. And it's okay when you're in your 20s, et cetera. But over a certain period, it builds up and then the system starts to break down. So my experience with sort of, burnout it did lead to the million tree pledge in a way as well as i'm i'm recovering from long covid and the reason i got that is that when i got covid in march 2020 the economic sky was falling in you think about it, i didn't know furlough was a word i didn't know i didn't expect the conservatives to give it to anything like furlough so we lot we we're having clients bringing up saying right we're, sh we're shutting off all marketing and i was there saying look actually you know helping the account director say evidence shows that if you do that you know, it's going to be harder for you to, to get back out of it. I kind of went into like sort of like on a war footing because I wanted to try and help people. So over a weekend, I worked and built a website called Digital Marketing When Demand Drops. And then I rang a friend of mine who's senior at Barclays and said, let's do a webinar of all your Barclays business customers around the UK of what to do digital marketing when demand drops. But I was doing all of this whilst having a cough, a fever, you know, like feeling a bit sick. But of course, you know, you've got to keep going. Well, I thought I had at least. And I remember doing that webinar for these Barclays customers and I had a fever and I was really worried because I was coughing so much that I didn't know if I could get through it. And the adrenaline took me through it. But then afterwards, I was sitting on a chair and I just collapsed and crawled into bed and I was there for four weeks. And what the doctor said is like, look, you were sort of on the edge of burnout anyway. And then a virus came and pushed you over the edge and you've got what now what's called post-viral fatigue. And then that transpired, they now call it long COVID. But I've I've met a number of people in the last couple of years who have been business owners, who have been really, really pushing it. Yeah. And athletes as well. It's normally business owners or, you know, it's, or people very high in their career really pushing themselves to the limit. They get a virus and it could also just be the common cold. It could also just be flu. So we're coming into the winter season now, right? 
And you've got to be so careful that it's just a convergence of problems. Your body's, you know, your immune system's low because it's, you know, you're really stressed. Like stress does lower the immune system. And then you get a virus, you keep pushing and like not eating properly, not sleeping, coffee, lemon syrup, sugar, all these sort of things. And it all converges to just a breakdown and then you get stuck. And what, what I mean when I said it, it ties in with the Million Tree Pledge is when I was stuck in bed struggling to breathe, that's when I thought I need a distraction. So I went into the ecology.com platform and started planting trees. And then I had that, that dream of like, what if I plant a million? That'd be amazing legacies leave. And then I researched it and it turns out that actually there's three trillion trees that have been lost. Mm. So that's half of all the trees on the planet. And a million and a trillion sounds similar. We know there's a big difference, but I remember an economist years ago explained the difference between a million, billion and a trillion in time. Have you guys come across this before? The difference right. in... Okay, so we're going to play a game here and your listeners are going to play a game. So if, if all of us now are going to count to a million, how long do you think it would take in seconds? I.e., how long is a million seconds in days, weeks, months, years? How long would it take for us to count to a million? Any guesses? Uh, I'm not as clever as you, uh, Marcus, so <laughs> I'm not able to do that. <laughs> Eleanor. <laughs> um, I don't know, 30 days? Of, is it days, this one? Years. Weeks. Days. Lifetimes. 30 days. You, you guys are good, honestly. Like most people say like five years, but it's actually, you know, a million seconds is 11 days. Okay. But here's the thing that's interesting. A billion, to count to a billion, will take 31 years, which means wow. a trillion is 31,000 years, which means three trillion is 93,000 years. So my my million tree pledge is like 11 days versus yeah. 93,000 years. So that's where the idea of the pledge came from is like, I need, we need other people to start doing this to start with the reforestation piece. So there was good things that came out of burnout, certainly in long COVID, and it helped me learn these things. Sounds like it kind of got you back on track with, yeah. you know, your kind of purpose in a way. I, I mean, think. what do you think about things like yoga or meditation or mindfulness? Because I find that that helps me a lot. And I know that when I don't do it, I'm definitely a lot. I, I can notice mm. the difference, you know, things like road rage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like You're an comes, angry person, basically. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but it comes out more. And I, I do think that stuff works. Like meditation is hard. Like it, I, I can't you really, <laughs> but you know, it's, do you, do you have any experience of that? Do you think? It yeah. Is? I've tried all of them and you, you do what's right, what works. But the thing that I've noticed is all of them work to the degree of the, there's a fundamental design that actually humans do better when we're slowed down to the speed of life and have less on our minds. So whatever mm -hmm. works for you, because yoga is just breathing, being present in your body. You know, it's all about slowing down and being present. That's the sort of thing that ties them all together. And even, you know, I'm not particularly, I'm not religious or spiritual, but some people just going to church or going to, you know, synagogue or mosque or somewhere and just slowing down. I've read um, reading, like reading's really good at, at yeah. um, like de-stressing and slowing down. So Maybe that's why you're so good at this. <laughs> there's an there's a guy called Michael Neal, a, a coach I, I worked with when I got stressed, and he's, he's a fascinating guy. But he talks about it like a, a revometer in a car, your thoughts. Yeah. So you know, like you've got thoughts per minute. Like you've got revolutions per minute in a car. You have thoughts per minute. So say like zero to 100 thoughts per minute is like us now having a nice chat. You know, 100 to 200 thoughts per minute is, you know, me rushing around the office and then like someone's like you know calling me and then this and then like like 200 300 thoughts per minute is i'm really late for a meeting i'm coming in like it's like falling over like and someone shouts at me all that, like all these things are happening i'm really worried and thinking about it it's all going wrong you, we've all had those moments yeah but what do you do when you've got you've been over revving your car and the engine is too hot how do you cool it down yeah take your foot off the accelerator like in statistics they call it reverting back to the mean and the yeah. real i've realized is our default is is well-being right not like bliss and like ecstasy and all the rest of it but you know to, you know, I, I, you know those, those people have got i don't know if you guys have got kids but i've got an eight-year-old son but you notice that with children right young children their default when they wake up is happy they're and content you know and then they get upset and they need feeding or they fall over but their ability to just like let crappy thinking go and just slow down and be present they're enjoying life yeah. and I think there's a moment i've observed i don't know if that's true for other people as well but you know when you first wake up and before the brain starts chattering there's almost a second if only for a moment where you're just like yeah it's pretty cool being yeah. alive 
oh no, I'm <laughs> and I'm late and blah blah blah. Mm. Then you realise it's the thoughts that are taking you away from that. So to so your point, yeah. Ellie, yeah, all of that stuff, meditation, whatever works for you, just try it. The thing I found with meditation is like I end up sort of stressing myself out about not doing it in the right way, and then yeah. I got a bit competitive with my mum on uh, Headspace that oh, you know yeah. we'd like, have these streaks and like I didn't want to miss a day and I remember like waking up at like 11 30 I'd just gone to bed and sitting up going I haven't meditated yet and like rushing out <laughs> realizing that's completely the wrong energy so yeah. I think if people yeah the thing I've just observed which seems to be universally true is we feel better when we're running at the speed of life rather than sped yeah. up food. and we just we do better when we have less in our minds and it's okay and the way we have less in our mind is we just you know just slow down and just wait and there's a natural sort of system that lets us sort of drop back in and whether it's going for a walk or yoga or any stuff like that helps and find what's right for you i think it's um i think it's hard in like a, a bit like obviously we've got like a fast growing business and i think it sounds mm-hmm. like you've experienced that and i think it's hard because it seems like everyone in our organization it's like every day people have this plan of what they're going to work on and then they get interrupted with other people even clients and obviously that's always welcome but all of a sudden it's like you thought you were going to do something and then someone else has taken control of your time. And I think that's what builds the stress up a bit. Um, and obviously yeah. something that, like, especially Eleanor, like you're really passionate about trying to resolve this, you know, because we, obviously we're like mm. a people and planet brand and we're trying to think what can we do differently in, in our day to day and with our staff. Um, but yeah. What do you guys do at Fountain? What's your secret? Secret so dealing with, I think, it's uh i think it's just to w- what we do for culture which works really well um is we have we have a, a coaching system in place so that they, the guys will coach each other and that's really lovely because actually they'll learn to coach but you've just got someone who you can just go to and just say and just unload a little bit and say here's what's going on like, i had all these plans and this has happened and it's sort of like and the guys are just trained to sort of you know just just not to sort of tell people what to do but just listen and just be present with someone. That's almost enough because that, again, it slows them down. All, all of that sort of busyness in their head, noise in head is now projected out and they just feel a little bit yeah. better. They got it off their chest. And then, you know, when they're a bit settled down, you know, they probably know what the right thing to do is we try and ask the coaches not to give too much advice because often your advice isn't right. Like, you know, yeah. you guys know what's right for you. You're smart people. It's just when you're stressed stress makes you stupid it just does with all of us it, you know they've proven yeah. it shuts off you know fight or flight you shuts off thinking past the brain so when you're in a low mood sometimes it's just like look you're in a low mood it's okay like let's just write it out and let's give you support in the meantime like like do tasks that are more simple rather than force yourself to like give that person a call back or whatever but yeah, I think it's just it's just caring for people, understanding that life's a contact sport and everyone's hurting at different stages at different times. And, you know, to your point at the beginning about communication, it's always thinking about other people's points of view. But it's hard to do when you're stressed because then you're blinkered and you're feeling bad. So you're in a more selfish place, an ego place, rather than being able to go, yeah, gosh, that must be tough for you. Yeah, if I was in your situation, that'd be really mm. difficult. So we try and build that culture of caring because I think our clients deserve it as well you, you can't you can be really good at you can be really talented but you can't outperform form a bad mood in a bad state like if you're in a real stressed low mood fight or flight run down you can be the best digital marketer in the world but you're never going to be perform very well so that's yeah. i think why culture is so important and plus you know life's hard enough as it is you last thing you want is work being a difficult place like we when we found a fountain, I found it with, my, with with three other people and they all worked at a, in quite a toxic workplace. And Rebecca, my other half, came home one day and she was in tears because the people were shouting at her and stuff like the boss was really toxic. And I said, that's it. We've had enough. We're going to build a business where no one ever goes home crying. Like, that's just it. Like, we just don't, you, you, you can do it. But it's it's hard. You just got to be patient. It takes time, you know, and there's ups and downs. And the more people you have, the more, you know, <laughs> dynamics yeah. occur. But you know we we're pretty careful with who we let in at fountain you know like there used to be people that do do have emotional sovereignty or at the very least if they don't have complete emotional sovereignty are coachable and are open to saying yes yeah, sorry i was wrong i was in a bit of a bad mood rather than can be like no i'm the victim and everyone else is bad <laughs> so mm. i know that's helpful to people listening but that's kind of what we do here so um just going back to the million tree pledge. So can you tell us like, you know, what gave you that idea? Like, why was it trees? Obviously it's wanting to help the climate crisis and 
you know, what was it about a million trees? How, how does it all work? Can you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's an, there's an ease with like this is accessible for people to, to plant trees for really good charities like Eden Reforestation. I use personally the ecology.com platform so you can see the trees, but obviously we need to put back all those trees, regardless of the climate crisis, there's an issue of like biodiversity and everything else. But I think the big thing everyone misses about climate change is I think there's a narrative that isn't particularly correct that people have, have bought into. Of We just need to get to net zero by 2050 and everything will be OK. But of course, that's not true. If you look at the science, if, if we had got to net zero today, there's still about two and a half trillion tonnes of CO2 and CO2 equivalents that need to be drawn down for us mm -hmm. to have a habitable planet for sort of decades and centuries on. So my, my prediction is that, you know, in the second half of the century, you know, like you see sort of uh, wind turbines and, you know, not enough, unfortunately, but like, you know, uh, energy pylons and stuff, there'll be loads of like direct air capture machines just sucking it all down. Um, but the technology is not there yet and we don't know if it ever will be, but I think that's where we're going to have to go. In the interim, you know, you know, trees are a great way of drawing down carbon. Um, they're a good medium term solution. Um, you know, and I think we, we all need to be doing that. And the cost per, per tree is, you know, anywhere from sort of 10 pence up to like six pounds. So you can pick where it is and so on. So it's it's so important for drawing down. And I think, you know, like I'm looking at my own personal net zero, right? So my house has, we've got the air source heat pumps. Um, we're getting solar PVs this year. Obviously, I use, I use ecotricity for my energy supplier. Um, I've got a hybrid, but the next car I'm going to get is going to be electric. So I'm kind of going through like like business to do with scope one, two, and three emissions. I'm doing my own personal scope one, two, three emissions. <laughs> um, but everyone needs to be doing that. But I think the point of the million tree pledge is going way beyond your carbon footprint, right? Like by planting a million trees, fountain will draw down, you know, forty top like like the equivalent of forty fountains. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And for me, an important thing is looking at your lifetime emissions. So what have you what have you as a business dumped into the atmosphere? And are you taking ownership for that? And not just taking ownership for your own emissions, but for other people that won't, you know. Um, and I think that's so important. It's an important story that I want to tell them, you know. When I when we looked into it, I was surprised it's not actually that expensive to plant trees. I mean, yeah. it's not cheap, but you know, for businesses, is it something like one hundred eighty thousand pound at the moment if you wanted mm. to plant a million trees, roughly? Mm. Yeah, like I mean, because I guess a lot of businesses will think this is a great thing to do, but you know, with the economy as it is, surely that's something we can't do right now. You know, is it? You know, what's the kind of business case for it? It's, yeah, yeah, it's a great question. It really is because I think not that you want to do it for a return on investment but we have seen from a lot of our pledges like good stories about oh since like the first thing that we noticed at found and i'll talk about us from our pledges is that staff retention I and mean, we've got a really high staff retention anyway but lots of people wrote to me people i didn't know who you know that were worried about the climate crisis like staff members if there's 50 of us at fountain you see but people were writing to me saying i was so worried about the climate crisis i'm so happy part of the business is doing this so that helps staff retention well that's good because there's a cost to that as we know like you, it's, it's expensive to hire people and there's recruitment fees and all the rest of it there's then also a client retention piece as well right you know clients really like it and they talk to us and especially one so we've got mitsubishi heat pumps as a client they love it you know they're really excited and they, we're looking at doing stuff together so like you know and there's opportunities of that there's joint pr stuff and then james lizards who's one of our he's an accountant he's one of our pledges said the way he looks at it is it's costing his business maybe two percent of revenue a year because he's doing it over maybe six or seven years he's like if me talking about this doesn't attract like-minded customers mm -hmm. to be more than two percent a year i'll be really surprised and he's actually gathering data to make the clear business case so i think yeah you know if you look at it as like i mean there's organizations like one percent for the planet but if you look at it as like well if it's one or two percent of my revenue what would need to happen to make more than that back and is there a high probability of that occurring if i take the pledge given the the positive PR both internally and externally, I'm pretty sure there is. There's an early mover advantage at the minute, you know, because in hopefully in five, ten years' time, there'll be many thousands of pledges and it might not be an exciting thing anymore. But you know, it, it does distinguish you from other people that have just perhaps joined ecology and are doing just the it's great they are doing the bare minimum, but they're just doing the basic tree planting at 50 pounds a month or whatever. 
I think yeah. I think one of the nicest things I've seen is like I, the Million Tree Pledge is a really good example. It's like building a real community around it, mm. um, and yeah. you know businesses collaborating, and I think that's where they can get some kind of value back. Um, I mean, not that you need value because like ecology is testament to you know, an organization where people literally get nothing tangible for planting trees. It's just, <laughs> it's just the kind of the, the feel good of actually doing something positive. But I think the community that you built around the Million Tree Pledge, I think that's, you know, that's reason enough for people to get involved. Um, yeah. That's what business is at the end of the day. You're entirely right. It's, it's so, and community is what people want. You know, we're sort of, we're social animals, right? We want to be around and that's, it makes it worthwhile. But no, you're entirely right. We have built a lovely community around the Million Tree Pledge. And there's a lovely one around the college. And I've met so many incredible people on this journey on the last sort of 18 months. You, you guys included, right? It's been, it's just a pleasure to meet such amazing, like-minded people. And I think at a time when there isn't much hope, it really does give you hope. Yeah. And is it true that if you're a smaller business as well, do you have something where uh, smaller businesses can come together and plant a million trees collectively? I'm just thinking for, for those smaller businesses that, that can't commit. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So we people. So even though there's, I say only, there's only forty five million trees pledged. There's actually seventy five pledges. So they have, what we we have what we call collective forests because our our smallest pledger is a one woman band. Um, you know, Laura, who's wonderful, and she's you know she's a sole trader, and but she was very bold in the run up to COP last year. She said, right, that's it. She took like most of her savings in her business about 10 grand or so took it out and just planted hundred thousand trees and said, right, I've done this. Any more sole traders or very small businesses want to join me in doing a hundred thousand and we'll have a collective forest of 10 people. So we've got, I think we've got four or five of those forests that have individuals that pledge to do a hundred K trees. So, and that's around sort of 10, I think it's closer to 18 grand now because the prices have gone up but it's more affordable and, the, and people are doing it over a longer period of time they don't have mm. to do what Cora did and just do it in one fell swoop you can do it over you know three four years or whatever and but you're right Elliot just it helps it become much more accessible to people so uh how do businesses get involved then if they want to uh join the million tree pledge <laughs> brilliant well look you, they can reach out to me personally obviously I'm always on LinkedIn, as, as, as Jack was saying. Um, but yeah, you can go to milliontreepledge.org and inquire through the website and yeah, or get in touch with you guys. Hopefully you'll put them uh, our way as well. So I think, yeah, just 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 if you know anyone who might be interested, doesn't have to be, you know, your organisation might not be in the right place to do it right now, but anyone you know, put them our way. I should say the Million Tree Pledge has two parts. It's not just about pledging to plant a million trees and doing it. The second part is finding at least two other pledges. So oh, yeah. it grows exponentially. So you may have done like, you know, Crystal Hosting is a brilliant example, wonderful hosting business. And you know, they, they, they actually pledged to plant a billion trees now, but they've already done their million. Jeez. And I think they've got, they've got us one pledger so far. So they still haven't finished their full pledge. Even though they've planted a million trees and got us one new member, they need one more to have completed their pledge. So that's a really nice way of doing it as well. Yeah, amazing. Um... So yeah, I think obviously this podcast is all about um, helping businesses to be more sustainable. I guess what we'd like to know is if you had, we might have covered this already, but if you had kind of one piece of advice to give to businesses um, on how to be more sustainable, what what would you say? Oh gosh, one piece. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, probably the quickest thing is just switch to 100% renewable energy provider, right? I know bills are going up. Obviously, I'm a big fan of ecotricity. I think they're brilliant, but there's the good energy as well. You know, go on to which.co.uk and it will, it will rank the best, like the gr real greenest renewable energy suppliers, not just, you know, the big six that say they're doing a bit of renewable energy. You know, I like I like ecotricity because they're putting a lot of money, they put nearly all their profits back into building more wind turbines and solar farms. And I think that's really important. So that's probably the quickest thing they could do. Can I? I'll sneak a second one in because I'm being <laughs> Obviously, ecology, you know, you just start planting trees, buying carbon credits that invest in moving us towards a more sustainable future. And then obviously, if you once you get a sense of ecology, it's sort of the gateway drug for hopefully million tree pledge. So mm. there you go. I, I keep thinking, because obviously we've joined the million tree pledge, and, and obviously your concept of if you join, you have to sign up two new people, which is really clever. I mean, that's how like Uber built such a big business with that kind of thinking and i kind of feel like 
if if you're a tiny business and you feel like this is too big a thing for you to do, I kind of feel like you're still a platform. You've still got customers. I mean, we're a tiny business and we've got probably three and a half thousand customers. So I kind of feel like each person should just be trying to collaborate more with their clients, you know, because you might not be that powerful, but your, you know, your customer base might be. Um, so, yeah, I, I sit on the Beamer Sustainability Council and we kind of like, We've got, we've got five things from it. So BEMA, sorry, British Interactive Media Association. It's for all the agencies. And we've got like five steps that everyone should take. And the fifth one is influence because there's about yeah. 400 marketing agencies in that trade body. So all of us have so many customers that are pretty much all of the people that can afford to use a marketing agency, right? There's just thousands and thousands of them. And if we influence our customers to be doing this sort of thing, or our clients rather, then that makes such a big difference. You're entirely right, Jack. It's sort of like, what can little old me do? But well, no, but you you've got a network that you can mobilize and encourage to take bold action because let's not mess around here. We've got what seven years and uh three months left to half mm-hmm. emissions globally to stay on track to get to it by 2030. We have to have to half it. At the minute, it's going back up. It's going the yeah. wrong way, so we're completely failing at everything here as as, as a world, not the three yeah. of us, obviously. <laughs> we'll fail, guys. <laughs> I uh, I actually had a question, Marcus. I wondered um, what what you thought the world was going to be like in ten years' time. Oh wow! Like to get your views, your ideas. Where do you think we're heading this time in ten years? Twenty thirty two. Well, perhaps where would you like us to be? <laughs> well that's two versions but yeah let's hear both versions okay the way it's heading isn't that great unfortunately it's uh, i think the summer's just you know we'll look back and say gosh that summer in 2022 when there was a bit of a drought and it was really hot that's just sort of like we'll be, we'll be wanting a summer like that i just think it's gonna get the trouble is we're humans as we think linearly right but the world changes exponentially so there's this compounding impact of the climate crisis so the warming we're feeling now, this hot summer, they, they reckon NASA reckon there's a lagging factor of about 25 years. I mean, you guys might correct me on this. I think that's about right. So the warming we feel now is from the emissions up until like the sort of like the 90s, right? You know, the late 90s. So, but since like the late 90s, we've dumped more CO2 in the atmosphere than the, the previous two millennia before. So that lagging factor and that exponential. So I think we're just going to see a lot more problems, problems with failing crop yields, more climate, refugees. I mean, you know, uh, is, it, is it Pakistan and Bangladesh? Like a third of like a third or a quarter of it was underwater recently. Like it's, it, there's already cracks on the supply chain. I can't see it getting much better. But hopefully there'll be lots of scurrying around because all the climate change denying and all the absurdity of like, let's keep drilling for oil in North Sea would have just been squashed. So that's the hopeful side that the current, you know, uh, if I could be political, the current prime minister who uh, is trust now, uh, who used to work for Shell and whose biggest donor was uh, the chairman of BP and has just let lots more people drill oil. Hopefully they're out by now or by by the 10 years of the time and we've got more sensible politicians in who are saying you just can't drill anymore you can leave it in the ground and there's an absolute mobilization towards getting a house that looks like the one i'm trying to build you know everyone's got their, their boilers have been ripped out we've got air source heat pumps pv uh, everyone's driving electric cars and this is a lot more international agreement you know china and india aren't just phasing down coal they've turned it off so I've gone from perhaps a negative to the positive of like, that's what I'd love to see. But on a positive, yeah. a really positive note, Million Tree Pledge has got billions of trees pledged. You know, we're really making good guns on reforestation and that's that's exciting. And then perhaps hopefully more money is going into technology. Like we are at Fountain are giving money towards things like direct air capture, biochar, you know, seagrass, sea algae like this. I love trees, but it's not me just saying it's trees or nothing. It's mm. just, you know, there's a, a plethora of solutions and we need to just work, get a portfolio up and see what works to draw down as quickly as possible. So, yeah, it's it's going to be a mixed bag. I think that's my forecast. Sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think? Any suggestions? How do you guys feel? Um, 
I don't know. I think you might be prime minister in ten years, Marcus. Oh, That's just I hope my so. <laughs> my guess. <laughs> I'd have to go. I'd have to pick a party. If I went back into the Greens, they're not going to get elected. So I have to pick a main <laughs> party. That might be tricky, but it's very kind of you to say. <laughs> just out of interest, if you could have gone back and given yourself like one piece of advice, like just one piece of advice when you were starting out in your career, you know, or maybe when you left university, what would that be? Uh, worry less. <laughs> probably. It, is that possible to worry less i don't know Do no think, probably it not possible? but it's a difficult question because i'm going back from a place that it kind of worked out okay in a lot of instances so but did it work out because i worried i think just you could i think you can you can achieve what you want with just being a bit less intense and a bit kinder oh. to yourself and others is probably the way not that i've been particularly mean to other people but do you know what i mean there's been moments yeah. when i've really I wanted to imagine you being mean to people marcus <laughs> to both of you no i think my other half and you know like i I run fountain with rebecca as well but there's been moments when i i'm quite driven so when i want to achieve something it's just blinkers and you know i won't have time to you know think about what rebecca's going through and support her at the same time i'm just all in at different points and you know actually it's interesting i heard steve wozniak speak years ago at an event um his co-founder of apple with uh, steve jobs and he said he spoke to Steve Jobs, you know, a few days before he died, you know, sort of on his deathbed, and asked him what his sort of big reflection was, what he would tell his younger self. And Steve yeah. Jobs said, "Yeah, probably that I could have achieved everything I achieved, but been a lot less of an asshole." Um, yeah. So I don't like the king asshole, though. You know, so as great as he was. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's just some truth of like let's with all of this let's be kind right you know obviously yeah. i was disparaging the current prime minister she's making bad decisions but with all of it let's try and be kind with everyone a lot of people are doing the best with the, what they've got available for them and the stories they're believing right now but i think uh yeah we can be kind to ourselves and be less stressed and kind of to, to be others and make them less defensive so we all listen to each other and try and find a way out of it mm. And and what does it take to to build a company that actually has a positive impact on society? In your opinion, what does it come down to? Consistency, um, I think. Yeah, if I, like it's the amount of people I've met over the years. So as we started Fountain thirteen years ago, um, who every three or four years they've got a new business, and they just yeah. either that they get bored or they change or they, you know, unwind it because they've got this, they chase the next big thing. And actually, sometimes it is just it's just turning up every day, you know, um, consistency over intensity every time, you know. Uh, there's a great quote, isn't it? That failure can't cope with persistence. So it's like, with Fountain, there's two options, right? There always was. It was basically either either Fountain goes bust and and we all, or I die, or like we keep we just keep going. So when it, there were tough moments right at the beginning, but it's like, well, I'm not going anywhere, and none of the rest of us. So it's basically we just we we get back up and we try again. And just stay consistent, just keep turning up each day, regardless of how you feel, and just trust it will work out. Good advice. Yeah, do it. very good advice. And the dear <laughs> service to reuse box. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, well, yeah, thanks for thanks for your time today, Marcus. It was really, really cool uh, speaking yeah. to you, really enjoyable. And, uh, yeah, nice to see you again. Thanks for listening to Earth Your While, the podcast that uncovers the truth about how to make your business better for the planet. We hope today's been worth your while. Earlier this year, we joined a group of inspirational business leaders who pledged to plant 1 million trees over the next 10 years. If you'd like to help us reach our goal, or you'd like to find out some more information, head over to reuserbox.co.uk forward slash earthyourwhile.